Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Welcome to Vox Novus, the new voice. When someone close to me was receiving physical therapy for a back injury, this person was instructed by the therapist to use certain techniques in repetitions of 10. Not being familiar with the techniques, the question was asked about the source. The answer was Pilates. I recalled seeing references to Pilates at exercise studios throughout New York City, but never really explored this. Recently, I received a copy of a book entitled Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. Imagine my amazement when I discovered that Pilates was actually a man's name and that today his techniques are practiced by more than 10 million people worldwide. My guest this week on Vox Novus is John Howard Steele. John Howard Steele practiced law for 60 years and Pilates for nearly as long. As one of the few people still alive who studied with and knew Joseph Pilates both in and out of the studio, he's in a unique position to tell this story. John Howard Steele has been interviewed in numerous publications and regularly lectures to teachers and studio owners on the history of Pilates. He lives in Santa Barbara with his wife, Bunny. He joins me this week to discuss his first book, Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. Please join me in welcoming to Vox Novus, John Howard Steele. Welcome, John. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. And thank you. Now, before we discuss your initial meeting with Joseph Pilates, please share your early life path, your upbringing, and choice of a career in law. Well, that, that's the first time this has been asked to me in connection with the book, but it, it is important. That's a good question. I was uh, born in New York City, and um, my parents and my grandparents uh, left New York, oh, about 1937, 38, and uh, moved to Florida, Miami Beach. And then as uh, World War II was developing, uh, they... They both got frightened. There were actually submarines off the coast of Florida, and we moved to North Carolina. And I lived there on a farm from, I guess, 1941 to 46, and then came back to New York City, where I started in, uh, in public school, PS6, which uh, had by then a well-established uh, North Carolina accent. So I got left at quite a bit in class when teacher would call on me and I would say, yes, ma'am. And uh, it, it eventually uh, wore off, as, uh, as it always does to people in New York. And... I acquired what's now identified everywhere as a New York accent. And then I went, uh, went away to, uh, was sent away to military school in Indiana, Culver. And from there, I went to Princeton University, uh, where I studied engineering, got a degree in engineering there. And from there to Columbia Law School, and I started practicing law. Right after I got out of law school, I actually pra practiced patent litigation for many years, and then I got a little tired of it, I guess. And then I just started practicing uh, general law, and I worked for a firm in New York and did litigation for them. And I was in and out of a lot of firms. Uh, it was a difficult time for me in, in many ways. Uh, and along, along came uh, Pilates at that time in 1963. I got out of law school in 59. And there was something about, uh, uh, there was something about uh, two aspects of it. One was the personality of Joseph Pilates. And two was the actual 
Pilates routine. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, Joseph, uh, he was somehow a beacon light for me to get out of what had become kind of a, a very uh, insecure. <laughs> I was very secure. I had, but my parents had enough money and I'd had a very good education. I didn't have a lot of debt, but I was quite lost in who I was. And there was no way uh, that I could find out who I was within the social confines I was involved with, which was striving to be, you know, a hotshot New York lawyer and hotshot New York social person and all of that. And there was something about Joe which I did not, I couldn't articulate. I, it, it wasn't a conscious thing even that represented a way to help me uh, find myself. And so I was immediately attracted to it at the same time that my first experience with Joe was very, very difficult. And uh, it was uh, repulsive in many ways. Now we're gonna we're gonna touch on that first meeting, but your parents and especially your mother were practitioners of Pilates. Tell us about them and how they introduced you to the practice. Yeah, they were, and uh, um, my father, and my mother uh, didn't work ever. She was a classical housewife mother at the time. Uh, uh, my father, my father worked as little as he could. He was, he was, he was quite lazy, actually. <laughs> uh, he was an absolutely wonderful man, uh, extremely ethical and uh, involved, but he was not very ambitious. And that, uh, I could probably figure that out why, but. It's not important right now, but they they were sort of like retired people. And <laughs> what they did was they, they kind of hooked on to weird, I called it weird stuff, uh, in, in the early, late 50s and the early 60s. People who had kind of remedies for how to get along in life and guru types, and they went from one to another, and I'd hear about these things, and I'd think, wow, they're really nuts. And I was nuts in my own way, striving to be this hot shot lawyer, but... Uh, you know, these were sort of faddish things, um, many of which would have been much more prevalent in uh, uh, Northern California than they were in New York. But they, they had an ear for this. And they had uh, my mother, who got to uh, Joseph Pilates through a choreographer who she knew from, I think, college days, uh, got to him, and she became absolutely obsessed with this, like uh, even to a higher degree than most of their other sort of crazy stuff. But uh, this she was really nuts about. She demonstrated it to anyone who would uh, listen to her. She had a wonderful figure. She was not very athletic, but uh, she took excellent care of herself. And she was a beautiful woman. So people, she would say, oh, I'm doing this. And people would sort of look at her blankly. And I kind of looked at her disdainfully because it, it, there was something in me that thought, gee, my dad's got to be a little jealous of this. He's talking about this other man and how wonderful he is and how he manipulates her body and does it. And I thought, oh, that's got to be a little disturbing to my father, who I adored. And uh, he didn't seem to mind. <laughs> but, you know, I projected that out. <laughs> it was kind of funny. And, and then 
uh, I and I did not have a very good relationship with my mother at that time, a very a brittle relationship. And my father was uh, he was very passive about that, very loyal to my mother. And uh, so he was always troubled by it. But I would see him for lunch and see him here and there and. He was very proud of me being a, a lawyer and all that. So uh, I, it was all right. But my mother, uh, and I had this chronic stiff neck, and my mother kept saying, oh, you've got to go to this uh, Mr. Pilates. He, he can fix everything. He fixes everyone. He's a genius. Daddy. And, of course, as a good son, I resisted that. Uh, but finally I gave in, and I gave in not not to get my neck fixed, but to get my mother off my back. I just was tired of hearing about this. And I went, and that's where the book starts, uh, of my first meeting with uh, the famous at that time, to me, uh, Joseph Pilates. Now, how old were you, and how old was he? He was, uh, well, it was 1963, so he was 80, and I was 28. And was that meeting warm and fuzzy? <laughs> <laughs> if there's anything that wasn't warm and fuzzy, <laughs> this was it. He, he, uh, uh, first place, he met me in, in the hall of, uh, of, the, of the building, a big, very large brownstone on 8th Avenue, in New York, he met me in the hall of the first floor. I had to buzz myself in so he knew I was coming up. And he lived there in the studio, or what was then called the gym, was there. And he met me in the hall, and, you know, I was dressed. It was very early in the morning, 7, 7.15 or something, and I was one of those ambitious people who got up very early. It wasn't a big deal for me, but I was all cleanly shaven and in my Brooksy brothers -y kind of suit and tie and, you know, English shirt with a high collar and polished shoes. And he was in these shorts, and no top. It was chilly and uh, 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 ballet uh, workout shoes were warm, just little canvas slippers, really. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I thought, well, he is a complete fake, just like I thought. And uh, he's got my mother uh, in, enthralled, but, you know, all right, so I'll get through this, and that'll be that. And I imagine, I never spoke to him about it, but I imagine he looked at me like, oh, God, you know, another spoiled preppy brat. Uh, I got to teach how to do, take care of himself, and yada, yada. And that's how we started. He hardly had a word for me. He didn't want to hear anything about my stiff neck, never mentioned my parents. Just get to work, get down on the, get changed, get on the reformer. And that's how we started. And I can tell you from as distinct a memory as I have of anything in my life, that that feeling on my part left, abandoned me almost within 10 minutes. I mean, he, he, captured, he captured my attention so thoroughly and... Uh, I, uh, there was no room left to, to thinking about what a phony he was or this. I just, I was, I was like a, a puppy in in his hands at that point. And that's how it stayed through the whole uh, session. And that's where I started. And what was that first session like? Well, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to explain this in modern terms because people have seen or know about Pilates. But 
I didn't know the first thing about it. It wasn't called polite, so it was called contrology. I knew it was some kind of physical exercise or therapy. Uh, and then when I looked in the studio and saw the equipment, which I had, I couldn't, you couldn't imagine equipment uh, in a gym that looked like this. The only thing I could imagine, you know, were barbells and weights and stuff like that. Not even the modern stuff that we see today, all these machines with weights and things. It was it was just bizarre. And of course, when he started and how he even taught was completely different than anything I'd ever experienced. And, and, and the routine, the choreography of the routine was completely bizarre. It was, you know, it wasn't like push-ups or sit-ups or any of the things that uh, you kind of know about uh, as uh, workouts or anything you learned uh, competing in sports in college. It was just, just completely bizarre stuff sitting down on a machine that he called the Universal Reformer, where what you sat on moved back and forth. And, you know, you had these springs and foot bar and shoulder rests. So you were uh, completely disoriented. And I guess now that we're talking and you've actually you asked me a question that brought this out in my mind, that disorientation forced me to follow him. There was no nothing, no guidepost, nothing that I could hang on to as, OK, well, now he wants me to do push ups. No, it was. And now he, he's telling me to do something with my legs on a foot bar with springs and a moving uh, platform. And, and so it was always uh, every, every move I made was brand new and into some territory that, uh, you know, I had even no imagination what it was. So that's what it was like. I just followed him a very uh, a precise, tried to follow him very precisely. I listened with 100% concentration. And that, that was my start. And at the end, as I point out in the book, I was nauseous and threw up. <laughs> he had an aversion to weights and weightlifting, didn't he? Yes, he did. He was very much opposed to any anything that was strenuous, and uh, and weights were one of his pet peeves. He he did not approve of weights or weight training or anything like it. He didn't want he didn't want you to strain ever, and uh, and weights I guess represented to him. A, a form of straining. And you share an interesting story about how you asked him about how the repetition, the number 10 came about. What was his answer? <laughs> he wanted to know if I had anything against 10. It was like, well, what do you care? Sort of thing. Is 10 a bad number for you? Is it the devil's number or something? It was that, with that kind of uh, thing, but that, then later he explained that everything was geared to making it uh, a dis. I, I don't know if I can get these words correct. He he wanted you to disengage your thought process from what you were doing, and he explained ten or any number. In, in the fact that you had to think about a number, so he gave you one that was extremely easy. Every, everyone is very comfortable with 10. So in essence... So that's where 10 came from. 
in essence, what he was telling you is what they said, the uh, advertising slogan that became big for a certain sports equipment company, just do it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, it was he he wanted your full attention away from the yeah, but the well, the attention that you that you give when you're taking a course in Dostoevsky, or he didn't want you taking notes. He didn't want you trying to memorize anything. He didn't want you uh, to have that part of your psyche working. He wanted it in, in the foreground. He wanted to let that work in the background. And he wanted your body to start learning the routine, not your mind. My guest is John Howard Steele. We're talking about his brand new book, Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. John, please tell our listeners how they can get your book and find out more about you. Uh, They can find out mine and the book's website, which is John Howard Steele. Uh, dot com steel has no e at the end and you can actually order you can click through to amazon uh, uh, from that website or you can go straight to amazon or in these times if you want to do a good thing uh go to your bookstore and ask them they have it or can get it in a, in a day or so and uh it's easy to get. It's uh, it's a it's a big seller right now on on Amazon. So they got it, and and you can get it actually in in about thirty countries. Wonderful, and we'll be back with more of John Howard Steele and Caged Lion Joseph Pilates and his legacy after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. The cutting edge of conscious radio, Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co creating a more conscious lifestyle. America, your children have an amazing superpower. That's right. They can help save lives by simply washing their hands. Just 20 seconds of thorough hand washing after they've coughed or sneezed or been outside can help fight against the dastardly spread of germs. Armed with only soap and water and hands, your superhero can protect you, your family, and everyone out there in America land. Amazing. Find out more at coronavirus.gov. A message from the CDC and the Ad Council. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your football buddy, your football buddy, or you, your best man, your worst man, you, your dog walker, your cat jogger. While one in three adults has pre-diabetes, with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. That's doihaveprediabetes.org. Wait, did they just say one in three adults has pre-diabetes? That's 33.33333% of adults. That means it could be me, my boss, or my boss's boss, or me, my favorite sister, or my other sister. That's seven members of my 21-person romantic book club. (gasps) Wait, the one in three could be me, my karaoke partner Carol, or my karaoke enemy Jeff. I'm going to take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its pre-diabetes awareness partners. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week, John Howard Steele. We're talking about his book, Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. John, please share with us a little about Joseph Pilates' background and how he came to found his studio in New York City. Yeah, that that was a very difficult a question for me to address when I was writing the book. When I when I started on this project, it was really only to lecture uh, Pilates professionals at, at one of the early. Pilates Method Alliance 
annual conventions. But when I realized that uh, they didn't know much about Joseph Pilates, uh, I was disturbed by that because I, I had a, a deep affection, love for this man. And to think that uh, 40 years or so after his death, a, a good part of them uh, didn't even know that Pilates was a person and that he'd gotten lost in 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 this revival of his of his uh, exercise routine i realized they didn't know about him but then when i started to think about it which you have to do when you're going to put words on paper i realized i didn't know anything about him and so i started to a look into it and do research and I came to so many uh, dead ends um, uh, dead ends not in the sense uh, not only in the sense I couldn't find more information but dead ends in the sense that I had been misled by what I read that it couldn't be right that this didn't happen that couldn't have happened that way my the, my inner lawyer got very busy at this stage, and I was uh, constantly thinking about, you know, it's like looking at the other side's argument. What what are they saying? And I mean, where's the chink in that? Where is it not right? And everything didn't make nothing made sense, and nothing added any answer. So I started to try to find out about his background, and my wife, who is fluent in German, we were going to go there, and we were going to do some research, and even setting that up wasn't going anywhere. So uh, that didn't seem like a, a, a good possibility. Then I came across a book written by a, a, a Pilates instructor, who, who, a Spaniard, who I refer to in my book, and he'd, he'd written this, he went on a seven-year quest to find out about Joe Pilates' background, and he wrote this book, and it's, it is, in a sense, a biography, but it's more in the sense of a recreated journal like what he did every day or every week and where he uh, lived and who lived next to him. And it was it's sort of a very difficult book to uh, sit down and, and read, but it had tons of information. I met this man, absolutely lovely man, in uh, Barcelona. We had time together. We talked about it, and he had as many doubts as I had uh, about the authenticity of Joe's story of his life. And he couldn't find answers to him either. So I was sort of confronted, as I am in answering this question, with what, what was his background? It, and I ended up saying I'm not capable of doing a biography it's i don't have enough time and number two i believe it would be futile i i he didn't leave any traces so that was a an important guidepost on what i was going to do why didn't he leave any footprints why can't you find out about Joseph Pilates' history in detail. There was nothing he wrote, no letters, no journals, no diaries, no records. So the gaps became the, the point of interest. And I had to sort of recreate what I thought were the important points of his life. It does, it's not a biography in the sense that you 
can read about the man as he developed, or the person, or the woman, or the child, as they developed along and made changes in their lives, because there's no explanation for lots of uh, physical things you know happened. You do know he did go to Great Britain, and you do know that he was incarcerated, and you do know that he came back to Germany for a, a very few years, and that he made two trips to New York, and that he made the second trip with Clara, and then you know that he established himself in New York, and that part is fairly easy uh, to follow. Uh, but he was already in his 40s when he got back here. He was 44, and uh, he had nothing. So I just try to connect the dots, and I acknowledge this right off in the book that I'm not you know, writing a factual biography, and I kind of work with it through what I knew personally of him and how he might behave. So anyhow, he gets to New York in 1927 uh, with nothing, uh, and really nothing, no background, no credentials, no money. Uh, the only thing he had was before he left Germany, a very famous uh, German ballerina named Hanya Holm, a dancer. She was not a ballerina. She was trained as a ballerina, but she was one of the first people to have uh, pursued what was then called and still called modern dance. Anyhow, she had come to him for help, and he had helped her with some injury, and she she was somewhat in the background. She still was in Germany. And he came to this country, and I think, I have no records of this, that through her he had some introduction to new, the New York ballet world. And I also think, and again, no proof, not even evidence, that she had come over from time to time to dance here, which had would have helped him get introduced. Anyhow, he got into the New York ballet world and he had this um, amazing charisma and the skill or ability or talent or genius, some people call it, of being able to fix people's physical injuries. And and that's where he started, and that's where he was uh, from, and I got to him uh, 37 years later, and that's where he was pretty much in exactly the same spot uh, 37 years later, doing exactly the same thing. And, and and that's pretty much, you know, we do know that he was uh, greatly admired by a number of uh, famous dancers. He was greatly uh, sought after even by opera singers because he could improve their uh, air control and their breathing. And uh, he had also developed other clients, and those were the people that I kind of knew uh, went to the gym. Uh, when I did, among them, my parents. But it, it it was a complete mom and pop operation in one facility. By the time I got there, there were two other very small, very private uh, studios or gyms. They were, they were studios in New York. One was in apartment store Bendel's and the other was in a private home, um, a room in a private home. Uh, but that, that's where it had gone when I got there. So it's gone a lot farther lately. Now, the practice was originally called Contrology. What was the philosophy he had behind these exercises and routines? 
Well, his his philosophy, which I think came out of his intuition, his philosophy was that if you could take care of your body and if you could bring into consciousness how you moved and what it was to cause movement in your system through doing exercises, even through walking, anything you did in life was really uh, his concern. You know, taking a pot off a shelf or uh, throwing out the garbage or taking a shower, whatever it was, it was all a m- movement that was was important to understand how you were doing it, why you were doing it, and and trick within your system that allowed you to do it. How did you trigger muscles? And anyhow, his philosophy was to get that integrated into into your your subconscious, maybe, but into your system so that movement became a meaningful activity in your life and he saw that as a a a answer to almost all of health which he also thought was vulnerable your health was vulnerable to your stress level and he thought modern life particularly apartment life in large cities, was extremely stressful and that this was, in fact, and in effect, the antidote. And and then he wrote or somehow got involved with, he is the stated author of Return to Life, which is still in publication. And... uh, and in that book, he espouses his exercises as medicine. It, it'll it'll keep you healthy. Now, some of and these prevent ex- disease. I'm sorry. Now, some of these exercises have very interesting names, like push the carriage and the teaser. Did you have a favorite? <laughs> I get that asked a lot. Do I have a favorite? Uh, I have some. No. I don't have a favorite. I do have exercises that uh, cause me more difficulty than others. And I would, you know, I have a natural instinct to dread them or, or not look forward to them. On the other hand, when I get through them, I also have a natural instinct to c- congratulate myself mm-hmm. and say, oh, God, you got you did that. So they, for an instant, become a favorite. And <laughs> but no, I it the whole notion of of contrology or Pilates to joke was that you start this routine, this choreography and from beginning to end it's one thing it's not it's it's like if 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 you see it as a as a piece of music it's not the individual notes it's the whole thing it's the space between the notes and the notes and the uh, doubling back and all of that or, or like a complete ballet so you you really, as you, or as I got into it, at least under him and with other teachers much later and continuing uh, to this day, I see it as one thing. So when I, when I have a, a difficult a passage, let's say, in it, it's just like a difficult passage in music yeah, you you have to work on that particular thing a little harder you have to your focus even becomes you know more precise and uh, uh, but you you don't have the luxury of saying oh that was nice or that was not nice so there is really no favorite 
His name is John Howard Steele. We're talking about his book, Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. We'll be back with more of John after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Olivia, from Washington. Laid off and trying to keep our little kids from realizing that mommy and daddy haven't eaten in a while. Roger from California. I'm grateful we could afford our son's surgery. I'm nervous that now we can't really afford food. Daniel from California. Choosing whether to pay the rent or pay to fix the car to get to work doesn't leave us with much at all. Now we can't even pay for meals. Donna from Louisiana. The storm just hit and we went from donating to the food bank to needing it. Keisha from South Carolina. I've been skipping meals so my two kids can eat, but filling up on water doesn't really work. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. America, your children have an amazing superpower. That's right. They can help save lives by simply washing their hands. Just 20 seconds of thorough hand washing after they've coughed or sneezed or been outside can help fight against the dastardly spread of germs. Armed with only soap and water and hands, your superhero can protect you, your family, and everyone out there in America land. Amazing. Find out more at coronavirus.gov. A message from the CDC and the Ad Council. Back on Vox Novus, my guest this week is John Howard Steele. He's the author of Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacy. When Joseph Pilates passed, how did you and his other friends and devotees continue the practice and keep the studio going? Yeah, that was was something that amazed us uh, because uh, when he did uh, die, I... And everyone else thought, oh, my goodness, this this is the end of it. And we did close the gym for a week. Uh, I remember handwriting a, a sign, putting it on the door. And then we reopened, and it, it was eerie in the sense that it, it was like he was still there. Everyone showed up. The, you know, there weren't, there weren't the social networks, there weren't cell phones. People just knew to come back. Uh, there were some, uh, some communication. Now, I guess the few people we had communicated among themselves. And uh, John Winner and Hannah came back. And Clara would come in. And it just kept going. Uh, it, it had its own life force. And yes, people did miss Joe. And yes, there was no way to do intake for new people. Uh, but for those of us who were uh, familiar with the work, who knew the work, and who had been coming regularly uh, for years, it, it was pretty much the same, and we 
when we needed help with anything, if we needed a push or if we got a little stuck or lost on where, what we should do or we needed someone to tell us to flatten our back or point our toes or uh, whatever, there was Hannah and John and uh, Clara and we just kept going. Now, it was managed originally I guess I was sort of the focal point of the management because I, I, I was the only one that really was socially uh, close to uh, Clara. And But then others uh, came to my aid immediately. My father said, all right, what can we do? And uh, Julie Clayberg, Jill Clayberg's uh, mother and father, and uh, a few Dan Reed, who was a clothing manufacturer, uh, Jim Lipton, maybe I don't remember so much. Cy Coleman, there were a whole group of these people said, "Well, let's get a little bit organized, <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll just uh, keep it going." And that's what we did. We got just a little bit organized. In fact, I think it was a period of almost uh, delicious disorganization. It we just it just kept going, and everyone was content. And, but you could see after a while that we had to make a couple of changes. We just couldn't. It couldn't go on forever. And then, of course, the landlord intervened because uh, Dance Theater of Harlem wanted the space. And the landlord, I guess, wanted us out. I, I never dealt very much with the landlord. Clara dealt with 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 him, and she said, we're going to lose the space. Clara was his wife, for those who didn't uh, read the book yet. Clara was his wife. Yeah, except they weren't married. <laughs> and that's in the book, too. And uh, uh, But she was definitely his wife. And and uh, uh, so we, we were, up, you know, up against up against deadlines. And none of us selfishly were prepared to let it go because we wouldn't have a place to do Contrology, and that was such an important thing to all of us. Uh, unspokenly important. We we just were motivated, uh, so we moved to uh, we created a whole new studio. We hired Romana Krasnowska and uh, built a beautiful uh, studio on Fifty Sixth Street between Fifth and Sixth and try to revitalize it. That was our first attempt to uh, really make it self-sufficient in, in, a, in a business way. I mean, it was self-sufficient under Joe and Clara, but that was mom and pop, 100%. So that's how it, you know, kept alive for long enough for this, its its seed to spread to the West Coast, where it really got revitalized entirely by Ron Fletcher. Now, there was a number of disruptions in that time, and they led to litigation. You had mentioned Romana. Uh, there was legalities involved. And ultimately, the, the practice per se... Uh, uh, folks can read the book and, and learn the whole story, but ultimately the practice survived. Uh, there's a number of teachers that emerged over the years. Some of them uh, gave their own spin to it. Did they stay true to the original practice? Yeah, that's a very common uh, inquiry. And th there's still a split in the community. I maintain yes that that the core of contrology is very much in almost every 
one of the 10,000 plus studios in the United States alone and an equal or greater number throughout the rest of the world. And I can go to almost any one of them and I can, first place, the equipment is functionally identical to the equipment Joe invented and built pretty close to 90 some years, 100 years ago. So that basically uh, uh, immediately tells you that there, there's a deep, deep connection. But there, there is a much deeper connection in, in the exercises, even in, in the exercises that are done without equipment, mat work. The, the movements, uh, the, the fact that you have to concentrate on what you're doing. You can't jump on, a, it's not like jumping on an extra cycle or a rowing machine and watching TV. Or, you, you've, got, you've got to think this thing through uh, internally, not consciously. You've got to get in touch with yourself. You've got to, you, you've got to concentrate on it. You get this, you've got to feel the stretching. You've got to feel the exercises. And I think when you get down to what's at the core of uh, Pilates, or Contrology, yes, they're all very, very much the same and they build to one degree or another, depending a lot on the instructor or the school, um, they they build on on exactly what he left. Um, it's a bit like classical music. I mean, when Bach wrote his stuff, the flute had one key on it, the piano was a harpsichord, the drums were totally different, the trumpets didn't have anything... And yet, when the New York Philharmonic plays Bach on all these instruments, you you, you know it's Bach number yeah. one, and you, you your breath is taken away. Well, Pilates has a lot of that to it. It's built on a fundamentally brilliant a series of uh, movements. If you could have a conversation with Joseph Pilates today, what would you say to him, and how do you think he'd respond? Well, that is the last uh, chapter in the book, because it, it's a wonderful thought of uh, projection. First place, he'd go nuts. I mean, <laughs> he was a very strict on following his exact routine he believed that his exact routine was the answer he didn't appreciate that he had stumbled upon if that's not a, a little too flippant but if he had come across some very basic things about the human psyche and movement and exercise he he didn't appreciate that so he he if if you didn't follow his exact routine he'd go crazy so if he saw what was going on now he would be absolutely beside himself uh he'd need sedation and <laughs> And I think with sufficient sedation, and if I was there next to him, and I could get him calmed down enough and tell him that this is his dream, that he did want uh, millions and millions of people all over the world to do this and enjoy it and to feel better about themselves, their lives, their families, their bodies, and that it had been accomplished through people that loved the work and loved him. And I think it might get through to him that, yes, this is how it had to happen. Wonderful. His book is called Caged Lion, Joseph Pilates and His Legacies. John Howard Steele, one more time, please share with our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you. You can get my book 
everyone easily can get it on Amazon. Best place in my mind during particularly these difficult times is go to, call your bookstore. Ask your bookstore for the book. If they don't have it, they'll get it for you in a day or so. Almost all of them will bring it out to the curb. You'll have your book. You'll help your local bookstore. That's a great way to get this book. But if the easy way, the fast way, Amazon. And there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It's the paragon of efficiency. And so that's what capitalism uh, rewards. So you can go to Amazon. If you go to my website, you'll learn a lot more about the book, somewhat about me. The website is johnhowardsteel.com. And there's a click through on that to Amazon. And um, I think you'll enjoy it. It's a, it's a good read. <laughs> John, John, absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Victor. We're going to resume this somewhere else soon, I hope. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us on Vox Novus. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. Mm-hmm.